Welcome to our Halloween edition of PAC TV Community News. This week, we bring you on spooky tours of cemeteries and houses in Duxbury, and we visit Halloween parties in Plymouth and Pembroke. PAC TV Community News takes you to a cranberry harvest in Kingston, and you'll see some haunting decorations from our area towns. So sit back and enjoy this special Halloween edition of PAC TV Community News. Kingston is a family-owned and operated cranberry farm. Each year's harvest is complemented by an educational program where youth learn about planting, harvesting, and producing cranberry products. Bog Hollow also features some additional October happenings, so Pack tv Community News decided to ride along for a late October tour. I'm Lydia Mathias and my husband and I are the owners of Bog Hollow Farm in Kingston, Mass. We've owned the bog since 1988 but have been in the cranberry business since the early 70s when we've owned other bogs. And this bog has been in my family since my grandfather bought it back in 1928. My uncle took it over in 1950, I guess, after World War II when my uh, grandfather passed away. And then my husband and I took it on in the late 80s and have been um, running it since. There's 16 acres of bog here and there's a total of 100 acres of woodland that um, is surrounding this property. We also now run a pumpkin patch where we invite families to come and they can take hay rides. We have hay wagons. We take hay rides to the back pumpkin patch which is in the back of our 100 acre farm. The dry harvest when they comb the berries off the vines is when you get dry cranberries. My husband and I have started an educational program where schools can come and learn how a cranberry is grown and how we preserve the upland that we do, the natural habitat that we preserve. And the educational program is really dear to my heart because I was a former teacher. And so we have elementary schools, second, third, fourth, fifth graders come and they learn about the cranberry. And they actually go on the cranberry bog and pick cranberries. They make a bog to take home in a little plastic cup. And they go into the woods and, as I said, learn about the habitat. And they also learn everything that a farmer would do all year round to produce their crop. Some kids think that they go to uh, the store and buy uh, their food off the shelf and it's already there, but we teach them where it comes from and how much work it is to grow a crop. It was actually grown like wild in the, in the dunes of Cape Cod with the sand. Uh, it grew in the sand wild and the early colonists gr uh, were able to harvest it um, themselves and the Ill in Native Americans also um, used it. Because the cranberry is a native, the native cranberry of Massachusetts, we really want them to learn about the cranberry. We have two sons and they are getting involved in the business. One son is going to take over the bogs from us and actually become a wet harvester. There's two ways to harvest cranberries, wet and dry. We have always been, since the day of my grandfather up until last year, dry harvesters. Only 10% of cranberry growers dry harvest. The other 90% are wet harvesters. That's that spectacular cranberry that you see floating on the water. On a beautiful day like this, um, it would be a wet harvester's um, dream to have a day like this to harvest. Each 
year, a benefit Halloween party is held at Plymouth Memorial Hall. Last year, more than 700 people enjoyed dancing, raffles and auctions, and also participated in pumpkin carving contests. This year, money raised at the annual Jeff Cohen Halloween Benefit Party supports the Emily Schwartz Scholarship Fund. PAC TV Community News popped in to meet the organizers and see the fun. This is the 17th year that Jeff Cohen has put on the Halloween fundraiser, and I think it's I see the second or third year that it's been at Memorial Hall. Um, I think last year we had about 700 guests and raised about $17,000. Um, each year the benefit changes. It always goes to a family who's either lost a parent or, um, a, or a child suddenly. And this year it's for Emily A. Swartz of Plymouth. She was a fourth grader at Indian Brook Elementary School that I knew really well. And um, she died suddenly a few months ago. And she loved music and loved to cook, so all the money that's being raised in this fundraiser and as well as a few others goes to continuing arts and arts education at elementary schools as well as scholarship for secondary education. And I think we're going to do really, really well. I think we might, we could come close to doubling what we did last year. From what I understand, I think we'll be well into the $20,000 range, which is just a significant amount of money that should should help a lot of kids and a lot of kids going to college as well. This year we have Dan Raposa doing professional photography for groups and individuals and we have awesome backdrops so we get to everybody gets to come and get their picture taken. They put so much time and effort into their costumes and all that money to get a really really good shot for free is kind of a nice little remember the night. We have the pumpkin game which is basically you pick a square and I think there's 10 prizes too so there's a 250 grand prize for each round of the pumpkin game and it's just kind of you pick a number and kind of raffle off different items. Um, there's everything from gift cards from local restaurants, Kate Katie's, um, I think Cabbie Shack, different, different items and you get to blind pick through the presents there. It's a silent auction so really you don't know who's, who you're bidding against and if you're going to win until the very very end of the night. No quick, you, know, you have time to come around and, and see where you're at and if you want to bid more and it takes a little while. But we have Red Sox tickets, Patriots tickets, Celtics, Bruins, um, oh my gosh, Justin Timberlake tickets. Um, gosh, there's everything. We have Davio's, which is a huge, huge restaurant in Boston and again, they have one in Gillette and they've donated thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, of meat prizes and dinners and, and hotel and gift certificates, things like that. And tonight down on the main floor we have dancing and costume contests, um, appetizers by Davio's as well as a couple satellite bars and then we also have G.J. Jean Dupree and Tattoo Cowboy which is a live band and they're phenomenal so it should be a lot of fun. PAC TV Community News visited another Halloween event. The Prom Angels Foundation held their annual Halloween party at the Pembroke Country Club, featuring games, dancing, and special Halloween treats. The Prom Angels Foundation, which provides safe and socially empowering activities for young adults with special abilities, hosted this fun Halloween affair. dances every year so Tori's dad always have it all the time and we try to donate money and everything so I like prom angels it's also always fun that's right my dad has been doing this ever since ever since when I was little I was asking this girl to dance with me and then all of a sudden she denied it and then her mother was talking to this her friend and then all of a sudden she called me the R word she calls me retarded and then he, she didn't know my dad was there behind him he was like hi my name is Kevin McKenna and no my daughter's not retarded 
So he, then a few years later, he turned it into Prime Angels, which we have it for proms, Halloween parties, and everything else. What I think about the Prime Angels is I've been here for, I've been do, going to these events for at least five or six years now. I first heard from it from some friends from Whitman Hanson. I was like, oh, seems interesting. May I'll check it out. And then after I went to the first event, I was like, man, I really want to do this again. And I've been doing it ever since. And Kevin, especially for uh, Kevin McKenna for putting on the event today, the uh, Halloween party for kids, uh, sponsored by the Prom Angels. They do a great job. We support uh, his events throughout the year, uh, obviously uh, primarily for a special needs community uh, throughout the region, by the way, not just here in Pembroke, but uh, all over the place. And uh, a lot of families here today and a lot of supporters, and it's just heartwarming to see. And it's uh, fun to be part of it. It's nice to be able to bring my kids to it. Duxbury is filled with history dating back to the time of the Pilgrims. Recently, the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society hosted a twilight tour of the town's Mayflower Cemetery, introducing some of Duxbury's most colorful 19th century residents. Tonight, PAC TV Community News takes you along. What we're going to be doing today is we are going to be meeting some of my favorite dead people, as I like to call them. This is not a ghosty or spooky store. There's not a lot of folklore. What I've done is taken the letters and diaries that we have at the archives and picked out some really good stories. And it's a great way to learn about Duxbury's history and who lived here by going through their graves and, and talking about them. I think I've got some good stories for you, so I hope you enjoy them. I've taken 10 people um, to talk about, but time permitting, I don't want to keep you out in the cold too long, so we'll see how we make along with that. Hannah was a remarkable young woman. At about the age of 13, she had a premonition that she was going to die young, and she would not shake this belief that she was not going to reach adulthood. And I'm sure her mother poo-pooed it, like, Hannah, stop talking about death all the time. But Hannah persisted in this belief. She was incredibly smart and gifted and loved to write. She could speak Spanish, French, and knew Latin. She was teaching herself Italian. Uh, as a much younger girl, her own daughters would write, I mean, her own dolls would write letters to her sister's dolls. So she was always practicing writing. When she was just 16 years old, one of her best friends passed away. And on that day, she told her own sister, my own time has come. And again, I'm sure everybody in her family went, oh, Hannah, this is not about you. Your friend just died. But she would not shake this belief. And sure enough, right after the funeral, she developed a fever. And it persisted and persisted, and no matter how many times doctors would see her, she continued to fail until she finally was bedridden with a tremendous fever, probably typhus, and she died within nine days of that. But here is Hannah Packard's, one of her poems from her book. Hours of my life, sweet ye they speed away, unrolls the current and I may not stay, unrolls the current, but soon it will flow, as speedily onwards, while I may not go. Dreams of my childhood, ye too have fled. Soon shall I follow and rank with the dead. So shall I follow, then better to be, 
Awakened ear visions seem real to me. Earth, then farewell, we meet not again, so would I part from the dwellings of men. Charlotte Bradford is one of the four Civil War nurses buried here in the cemetery. But um, her service is longer than almost any other nurses in the Civil War. She went down in the spring of 1862 and remained until September of 1865. And during that period, she worked on the hospital transport ships, which meant she took the wounded off the peninsula in Virginia and brought them up north to hospitals in Washington, Baltimore, and even as far as New York City. Um, she kept a diary during her entire tenure as a nurse, and that's how I say stories intersect. When she brought uh, patients to New York, she spent some time with Hannah Packard's sister in Brooklyn. So. We are always seeing stories interweave with each other. So Lucy Delano must have been a nervous woman because in the War of 1812, she was petrified that the British were gonna come ashore at Duxbury. So much so that she spent days prostrate in bed worrying about it. And wouldn't you know, one day a hue and cry went up that, oh my God, the British are coming. And so Lucy jumped up from bed gathered all her valuables together and gave them to her children to run down the street to bury. Down the street meant to Harrison Ave where her father-in-law, Samuel Delano Sr., had uh, a property. It's on the north side of Harrison Street where the golf, part of the golf course is today. So the children did her bidding and buried all her silver. Well, the British never arrived. She said, kids, go gather up the silver. And they went, I don't remember where it is. <laughs> and they searched and searched, but the silver was never discovered. So I guess that means while you're playing golf someday, <laughs> feel free, I, I give you permission to dig around where the Stellano house was and see if you can find anything. Duxbury's historic Alden House was haunted this Halloween by witches, ghosts, and goblins. Pack TV Community News visited the site to see the spirits. <laughs> this is the 12th annual Alden Haunted House, and uh, it's uh, a night where you know people come and get a tour through the house where we make it spooky, not too scary. It's a family-friendly event. Uh, it's just a good way to get uh, the community involved at, at the Alden House. Because if we don't have the deed, the big Mr. Crowley could foreclose on the property and the Aldens will lose their house. So we have to find it. Are you guys going to help us find it? Can we do that? Yeah? Awesome. is Mary Windsor Alden. People know me better as Aunt Polly. I am the first and only female owner of the Alden house. Rise up, spirits! Rise up! Show me that you're listening! Oh, yes! Yes, the spirits are there! Sitting on the stairs in the workroom, 
and I was covered in cobwebs and she was sitting with flowers and people didn't really see us because it was kind of dark and when they walked over they kind of jumped because they didn't, yeah. Yeah, it was all dark and they didn't know we were there until they saw us. Yeah, so there's pumpkin carving and we have baked goods and stuff for that for sale, but a lot of the uh, activities in the house and uh, most of the people in the house are um, local people that have volunteered. They, they decorated, they dressed up, um, a lot of Girl Scouts, um, the Community Garden Club, and just a lot of other actual just local residents that, you know, care about the house and chip in and like to have fun. The own house, um, it's a National Historic Landmark uh, Historic House Museum built uh, about 1672. Um, it is the ancestral home of John and Priscilla Alden, who were Mayflower passengers. So it's uh, a window into the past and uh, represents about 300 years of the Alden family. Tonight we conclude this edition of PAC TV Community News with views of area Halloween houses. Enjoy this seasonal scene and happy Halloween from PAC TV. Thanks for watching this week's edition of PAC TV Community News. Replay times are listed on our website, pactv.org. Just click on the PCN logo to watch individual stories or the entire program. And see us on YouTube by searching for PAC TV Community News Channel. Like us on Facebook to receive previews each week and links to all our stories. Thanks for watching and happy Halloween from PAC TV Community News.